morning, everyone. Welcome to the Media Roundtable on National Guard Domestic Operations and Support to Natural Disasters, with a focus on wildfires and hurricanes. I'm Major Jennifer Staten, and I will be moderating today's discussion. The event is being recorded, and everything discussed is on the record. The recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel following the conclusion of the event. Following today's opening statements from our three panelists, I will ask each of the reporters by outlet for questions. In the interest of time, please keep to one question and one follow-up. If time does permit, I'll come back around for additional questions. The Zoom chat window will be monitored throughout today's event, and we will be posting some helpful information there as well, including our, the biographies of our panelists. A quick reminder for all of our folks dialing in to keep your mics muted when not speaking. I'm honored to introduce today's panelists, Army Brigadier General Robert Paletti, Director of the Joint Staff, California National Guard, Army Colonel Larry Doan, J3, Current Operations Division Chief, National Guard Bureau, and Army Lieutenant Colonel Blake Heidelberg, J3 Director of Military Support, Florida National Guard. With that, I'll turn it over to General Paletti to open our discussion, sir, if you please. Yeah, good morning, and, and thank you everyone for participating in today's event. Um, we have been, you know, obviously very busy since about 2017 with wildfires. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that California has made significant investment over the last few years, more towards prevention rather than just reaction to California wildfires. Um, the governor has invested a significant amount of state money to put over 300 National Guardsmen on emergency state active duty, which is our task force rattlesnake. In the off season, the task force rattlesnake focuses on debris clearing with um, under the direction of CAL FIRE. And then it augments CAL FIRE with 14 type one hand crews during the fire season in the event of a fire. Um, they've made significant investments also in the air fleet for CAL FIRE, which alleviates a lot of the National Guard having to fly, which increases the readiness of our, of our aviation assets. Um, we have partnered with the US Forest Service and are one of two uh, task Force Fire Guards. Our Fire Guard program uses real-time geospatial data to identify fire starts, notifies local, state, and federal authorities of those fire starts so they can respond very, very quickly. Um, in today's changing world, though, we have to be ready for more than just wildfires. Um, we had responded the last two years to floods and California's first hurricane. I know that Florida is much more experienced at those than we are, um, but we are stand ready and uh, stand ready to uphold the National Guard motto of always ready, always there to respond to the needs of Californians when they need it the most. Thank you, sir. Colonel Heidelberg, do you have any opening remarks? Uh, yes, ma'am, thank you. And, and to everybody, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for letting us get the message out about not only how Florida prepares, but how overall the resiliency of communities and our states help us better respond, whether it's to forest fires like California is dealing with or to hurricanes. Uh, like Florida has been known to uh, be able to respond to. So it's a deliberate approach that we take in Florida. And as California mentioned, we've got great leadership that supports us and the state supports us not only from the legislature and the governor's office with funding and that support, but our leadership at the Florida National Guard and Major General Haas supports us in ensuring that it's a deliberate approach and that we devote a drill uh, every year just to our hurricane response and our domestic operations training. Uh, so we look at it and we plan and we assign specific tasks to units because we know that hurricanes are not only our most likely course of action, but they're also our most dangerous course of action. So it allows us to really focus on that. And we have a saying in Florida that you're either in hurricane season or you're preparing for hurricane season. And we try to really focus on that. Uh, obviously, we think that we have relevant forces that help us. So we have maneuver units that are relevant, not only in the national fight, but they really help Florida respond to the domestic operations and that training that they do every year and then they brief that back during their annual training reports and everything. So the leadership's completely involved. Everybody has buy-in, everybody understands their key task and requirements. And I think the most important thing that Florida does besides that training is a coordination that we do with the state. So we work closely with the state level to do training events, whether it's at the state level or at the county level. And then we work very closely with those counties to ensure that we're taking kind of all guidance and all direction from that local level because we're always in support of those local authorities when we respond. We're just one tool in the toolbox of the holistic approach from the government. And then the, the kind of third leg of the stool that we focus on, you got the Florida National Guard in our training, the state approach is the national support that we get from NGB, 
with the All Hazards Conference, where we plan with other states can come into Florida and help us if we need, or where Florida can help. And then we work with our Title X partners as well, if there are any gaps that the Guard can't fill or anything like that. So it's really a holistic approach that we take, and I think it, it helps us set up for success. We're only as good as our last response, but the support that we have from the leadership, our fellow states and the national levels, really helps make us successful, and, and we hope to continue to build off that success each year. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Colonel Doan, do you have any opening remarks? Sure, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for being here today. We, we always love an opportunity to talk about the great work that our, our National Guardsmen are doing out there in the community. And uh, I, I won't touch on much that my colleagues haven't already covered, but I'll just take a moment to talk a little bit about the role of the National Guard Bureau and our, our, uh, our place here at the federal level and how that supports what's happening in the states. And really specifically the role of my boss, the chief of the National Guard Bureau, uh, General Hopeson. So from his role as a member of the Joint Chiefs, and specifically having that uh, unique responsibility to uh, communicate the abilities and activities of the non-federalized National Guard, and then acts as that channel of communication from the federal level back down to the state levels, those adjutant generals who are actually out there getting the work done in the states. And you've heard a little bit about how my colleagues are, are interacting with their communities every day, and that's uh, part of the strength that they bring to the fight. That's the same thing we do here at our level, but our community is the federal government and the interagency, where every day we're working at our level to make sure we maintain strong ties across the Department of Defense and those combatant commanders out there that may have uh, capability to bring to bear, and then our partners at FEMA, the Department of Homeland Security, and across the wider interagency, and how we bring their unique talents together uh, in support of that state. So the, the unique nature of the National Guard, where you have these, you know, these 54 states and territories in the district, each with their own unique way of tailoring uh, problem sets, provide that local expertise, while the National Guard Bureau and its relationship across the federal interagency can bring the entire nation's resources to bear in support of that uniquely tailored solution so that we stay in a locally led, locally driven uh, response that's informed by those people who are experiencing disaster, but then supported by the entire United States of America through the federal government and our interagency partners. And you know, my years of, of doing this, uh, that, that's the special sauce that I think really brings the National Guard to the fore in these responses. And uh, the thing that our, our citizens have really come to rely upon on their, on their toughest days. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, we'll go ahead and open up to some questions. Reuters. Associated Press. CNN, Army Magazine, Military.com. I'll, I'll do a question, everybody. Um, hey, uh, Steve Bain of military.com here. Um, I'm not sure who'd be the best to pick this up, but I assume the Guard is very engaged right now, especially since half the country is either getting hit with tornadoes or underwater. Um, do we have a rough count of how many Guardsmen are currently deployed? And can that possibly be broken down by Title 32 and 10, please? Colonel Doan, would you like to start us off, please? Yeah, I've got I've got some rough numbers I can give you now, and uh, the breakdown by ten or thirty two. It's it's we'll we'll use we'll use some some broad strokes here, and I can certainly get you the finer details if you need them. But uh, mm -hmm. so currently, just through twenty twenty four, we're looking at about uh, two and a half million personnel days executed so far. With that two and a half million, about uh, you know uh, about a million or so uh, are are related to our war fighting mission to our our, our standard. Uh, uh, war fighting straits, those are overseas. And then within the United States, we have everything from uh, the operations in New York, their Empire Shield mission, which has been going on since uh, after 9-11, providing a lot of security. The largest uh, events we've been seeing are, are along the border, uh, a few hundred thousand events either there. The, uh, the wildfire mission so far, and it's still early in the year, we're looking at about 47,000 or so days executed so far. Severe weather looking about uh, 3,800. So we haven't gotten too many there, but we are still in the front end of the season. Interestingly enough, search and rescue, we've already uh, broken them. It's only 180 days. You have to recognize most of those search and rescue missions are one day events where we go out looking for somebody, one or two. So we're already fairly busy. You know, in comparison to last year, uh, looking back at 2023, we ended up with, uh, you know, more than 50,000 days in support of severe weather, more than 180,000 days in support of wildfire missions, you know, a thousand days of search and rescue support. 
So the, uh, the, the, the operational tempo for the National Guard is, is pretty busy. And uh, as you pointed out, with most of the country experiencing severe weather, even early in the season, uh, it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. Thanks. Uh, could I get it after of the total number of uh, troops deployed uh, right now just uh, in the U.S.? Would that be a possible number to get? We can take that, sir. Um, sir, and get that. Get that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to Army Magazine here. I understand there were some some technical issues. <laughs> Army Magazine. Yes, apologies, ma'am. Um, first, thanks so much for everyone for coming here today. I really appreciate it. Um, my question was sort of inspired by a post that you all put out approximately a month ago, where you talk about how. AI and other sorts of futuristic technology might be able to be used to support our disaster response, um, specifically through Project Thea. But I was curious if you all could talk a little bit more about how we might be, um, as you mentioned, during a particularly difficult disaster response year, getting after um, these threats ahead of time or more quickly through AI or other technology as we enter, I guess, the, the season where there might be more storms. Thank you, ma'am. General Pelletti, would you like to kick us off with that? So most of that for us is actually being done by our state partners. It's not being done by us. So I don't have a lot of information on predictive analysis being done by AI. Um, most of it is um, our part is incorporated into our fire guard program and trying to get the earliest response that we can to identification of the fire as early as possible. I'm not sure how AI plays into that, whether that will speed that response or not, um, but that technology hasn't made it to us yet, so I don't have a lot of information or comment. Thank you, sir. Colonel Heidelberg, do you have any perspectives from Florida? <laughs> You know, again, way out of my level of expertise when we're talking about AI at the Florida National Guard level, but our state is using it as the uh, general set for predictive analysis, really looking at uh, how it incorporates into the flood and, and the flooding in the impacted areas. And then also we know that uh, from the exercise that we had when NOAA was involved, they're using it for their tracking and predictiveness of the tracking. So we believe that they're, they're changing. Uh, and I don't want to speak for Noah, but they're changing the way that the cone is going to look that we're so used to and everything this year and all that. So we think it's going to help us with our prediction. And then we hope that uh, as the state incorporates more and more into it and our partners do that, it will help us in our response operations. But really, uh, that's all I can speak to on the AI right now. Appreciate it, sir. Colonel Doan, is there anything from the Guard Bureau perspective? You know, we certainly pay a lot of attention to developments in industry, and we're always looking at the, the capability gaps that exist within our force, both for our, our, uh, our science for Title 10 missions as well as disaster response. And, you know, I've been interested in a lot of the things, you know, just recently I was at Amazon headquarters uh, taking a look at some of the, the tools they use in their volunteer disaster response and how can we incorporate some of those things into products that we could use at our level. And that's, that's not an uncommon conversation we have with a lot of both private partners and, and intergovernmental uh, agencies. Uh, I think what's important here is that we, we've kind of gone from this world where we didn't have very much information about what was happening to this world now where it's almost a tsunami of information that hits us with reports back from everything from open source media feeds to, to drone feeds and cameras. And, and the challenge for disaster response is, is how do I parse through all of this data and actually get to something that makes sense so that people can make decisions on the ground about where do I put uh, scarce resources? Where do I put the, the priority of my response? And I, I you know, having done this for a little while, and I'm sure that, that my colleagues would agree that there, you know, AI will always be an, an interesting tool. It'll be a tool like many others that assist us, but the uh, the real work is always going to be getting done by those those service members on the ground. That you're you're still going to need a set of eyes on that flood embankment. You're going to need a, you know a person in that operations center who can use their 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 creative and critical thinking skills to work their way through that problem set and. Uh, that's, I think, where AI is going to become a useful tool for us to speed that, but I don't think it's ever going to supplant the work of those and the experience of those first responders on the ground. Thank you, sir. Carly, did you have a follow-up? Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. KLLD? First Coast News?
Air and Space Forces Magazine. Yeah, hi. Uh, Chris Gordon, Air and Space Forces Magazine. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, I know you can't predict the future, but um, roughly, what do you expect the need um, for aerial firefighting will be um, this season? And um, how many units in the Guard and Reserved um, and aircraft and air crew are certified in uh, aerial firefighting right now? Thank you. General Paletti, sir, can I start that with you for the wildfires of California? Yeah, so um, what I'm hopeful is that um, that response necessity is very low. We've had two good fire years. Um, we're focused a lot on debris mitigation, um, lowering the fuels in the fire areas. And then the in California, and that's what I can speak to, is that we have our MAP system up. We just conducted uh, uh, wildfire prevention week. We conducted our training for with CAL FIRE for our air aviation crews um, and recertified them with CAL FIRE. Uh, but I'm, I'm very encouraged by the amount of investment California has made both with CAL FIRE's fleet. I think they have 17 brand new UH-60 Firehawks now. They have three uh, certified C-130 MAFs, and in the NDAA, they just got seven more C-130s from the Coast Guard that will be coming to California. The first will be retrofitted for MAFs uh, by the end of this year. So I think California has an exclusive contract <clears throat> through CAL FIRE for additional civilian aviation assets, um, OV-10 Broncos, S-2 Vikings, a lot of aviation equipment. So um, we stand ready to augment CAL FIRE when needed. But I think that, that the California significant investment with CAL FIRE um, will hopefully limit how much blade time that we have to spend fighting fires um, because they're so much more ready to react than they were five years ago. Thank you, sir. Any follow-up to that, sir? <clears throat> yeah, I just, I, across the, the Guard Bureau, um, how many, uh, units are certified in in aerial firefighting you can take that question if you don't have an answer offhand but um uh, just curious on that this is larry down here so uh i i'll have to take that one offline because i don't know off the top of my head right now the exact number of certified crews and that that part moves around a little bit depending on tanning status the actual crews i do know that all the systems uh all the modular airborne firefighting systems were inspected this year and all of our systems uh so on the, on the material side are, are ready to go so uh, I'll have to get back to you on uh, exactly where we're on crew certification. We are we are anticipating everyone being online, uh, but I'll have to get you that exact number uh, in a follow-up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Homeland Security today, Mr. Stone King. Thanks very much. Thanks for doing this, and thank you all for your service. I do have a question and a very simple follow-up. My question is... Um, the elements of the National Guard, like uh, WMD, CSTs, the NGRF, the HRF, are those elements still um, uh, capable to be employed either in whole or in part as part of your support to respond to natural disasters? Colonel Heidelberg, I'd like to get this off from a Florida perspective. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And it's a great question. So, you know, this is a, a source and a resource that's in our state. Florida is lucky. I think California is another state. New York all have two CSTs. Uh, Florida is lucky. We also have a surf P. We don't have a HERF, uh, but Georgia does. But to answer your question as briefly as I can, first is yes. We use them in our domestic response operations. Absolutely. The CSTs are a truly a Swiss Army knife of capabilities. They've got a great communications packet suite. Uh, so we use them not only for C2, but as LNOs, they even augment brigade staffs when needed and different things like that. And obviously they can be first responders because they're typically ready to respond very quickly. We have a surf P, which has a myriad of capabilities, but typically they do a lot of search and rescue for us. Uh, we also have them rolled up into what we call our all hazards battalion, which is one of our first battalions that kind of goes out to coordinate and support the SAR effort. And then they help on the, on the back end side as we start into the you know, response operations and recovery operations. So we use those. We work closely with Georgia. We train every year with deploying the SURF-P, the CSTs, and the HERF uh, joined and combined as they would for a, a seaburn response. But we use them in domestic operations uh, every year, unfortunately, when we respond. But we do use those as, a, as a, another tool in our toolkit. 
Thank you, sir. General Paletti, anything from the California perspective? Yeah, so we are fortunate in the fact that we have two CSTs that have are tied right in with uh, OES operations um, that gets taskings from them. We also get taskings from federal agencies for the CSTs. We do have a SURFP or a Seaburn Task Force, and we have a Homeland Response Force, which I was fortunate enough to command as commander of the 49th Military Police Brigade. They are tied in very closely, and I, I look at them as an essential part of our all hazards response because California just doesn't deal with wildfires. I mean, you, you have a you have a potential that during a wildfire to have a seaburn incident if it hits a chemical factory or, or refinery or something else. But we also have to deal with the potential of an earthquake. And that is a no notice all hazards response. Um, you know, a hurricane, we get a weather report, a earthquake, we do not. And uh, if anyone's seen the movie San Andreas, that's what keeps me up at night. And I don't think the rock is going to steal a helicopter and save us all. So, you know, we, we plan very much with California Office of Emergency Services, FEMA Region 9, our state partners in Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, um, our bordering states that can really come and help us. Because if you look at the San Andreas fault line, it runs from the Cape of Mendocino to east of San Diego through San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles Basin, and then to east of San Diego where a large portion of my force structure actually sits. So when we look at, <coughs> sorry, when we look at planning for earthquakes, I have to plan for the fact that a lot of my force structure may not be available. And I'll have to use EMAC or other things to bring in things for other states to fill the capability gaps that will be created by the damage that may be done to my own facilities and my own infrastructure. But those CSTs, that Homeland Response Force, we use our Homeland Response Force because they're tied in so closely to so many agencies for their training. They are the natural, you know, all hazards domestic uh, response headquarters that we activate first and foremost is the JTF in the field while I lead things here at the state level with the Office of Emergency Services so um, and the Adjutant General. So I, I think that your question is very pertinent in the fact that um, they have to be tied in to that all hazards response. Otherwise, you're not getting that chemical recon mass decontamination capability. And the HERF that we have provides an immense amount of C2 capability or command and control capability to all of those assets coming to an all hazards response. I believe California was the first to use its HERF in total during the campfire, which you wouldn't think that, you know, that would be a, a, a viable response, but we used our security elements. We used our, our decon because when you have that amount of homes that were in the city of paradise burn now you have all the contaminants all those cleaners all that stuff that's in that house that is now dry particulate contaminant that's on the ground and we're in there searching for cremated remains and there was no decon taking place before those search workers went home we were able to decon them get that dry particulate contaminant off we developed a system for deconning the cadaver dogs which the army didn't have um, one of our sergeants, Sergeant Garber, developed that. It's basically giving a dog a bath, but um, and and getting that stuff. But even even so, using the expertise of the CSTs and the decon element, the county was simply throwing away the masks every day, and so we ended up cleaning them, putting in new filters every day, and saving the county about fifty to seventy thousand dollars during the response to that fire, just due to the expertise of the CSTs, the SERP, and the Homeland Response Force. So. Very proud of the work that they did while I was the commander um, and, and the way that we incorporate them through OES and FEMA into the all hazards response for the state. You know, Thank if you, I can sir. piggyback on that, it's, it's, um, that expertise uh, proved invaluable uh, down the road. So the, many of the lessons learned from the Paradise Fire, California's response, were then directly applied in Maui and their response to wildfires. And they saw a lot of the same problem sets that, that the, the Californians had dealt with. But because of a lot of those state to state level connections and the, the, the those trust networks already built in the guards, we were able to push those, those lessons learned forward quickly and uh, use the, the, the those Seaburn response elements resident in Hawaii in many of the same ways that uh, California had developed best practices. And, and we here at the National Guard Bureau also, we maintain a reserve uh, in uh, you know, our warehouses here of Seaburn response uh, uh, equipment, really. And it, it sounds like that would be pretty specific, but it ended up, there were pieces of it that were required in Maui that were, were absolutely vital. When the fires were so hot, it was melting the boots right off of the responders. We were able to push, you know, 100,000 pairs of 
of firefighting boots out there out of our, our semen response kits. We were able to push forward, uh, you know, masks and filters and cleaning stuff to uh, enable those uh, and extend the ability of those responders to stay inside that zone in Maui to reopen the areas for, for other first responders who didn't have that CBER training to get in and continue on with their work. So that, that depth of knowledge and that depth of response at the, at the national level all funneled back down to that state is, is again, as I said at the beginning, one of the hallmarks of how the National Guard solves problems. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Stone King, sir, do you have a follow-up? Just a very simple follow-up. Um, I, I know over the years, the National Guard has been referred often as the first military responder, but I have not heard that in recent years, nor do I see it on the website. So is that still an accurate description? And if it's not an accurate description, what's changed in the roles between the National Guard and the active duty? Colonel Doan, do you have any insights from your perspective? Sure. Well, I, you know, I'd say from a from a policy point of view, uh, it, we absolutely are still the first military responder. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I really can't speak to why that phrase hasn't been used as often. But our relationship with the active component continues to be as as it always has. You know, that we we are the first military responder. Uh, Maui is an excellent uh, example, though, of sometimes when we have to be more flexible uh, because of the the location or, or typhoons in Guam where uh, if you live on one of those islands, your neighbor isn't another state, your neighbor's the United States Navy. And so that's one of those times when the uh, National Guard Bureau works to, uh, to, to bridge that gap between the active component and that local and state response. Uh, really seamless and out there. And, you know, I have to provide incredible uh, uh, credit to U US Indo-PACOM and their forces out there in the Pacific Fleet and US Army Pacific. They, you know, they, they stepped up and were great. But there's a, there's a construct we started using called the dual status commander that I think has become very valuable in, in integrating that, that active component in National Guard response where a handful of officers, typically general officers, uh, generally a National Guardsman, but it doesn't have to be, uh, go through special training at, at NORTHCOM where they become certified by the, the commander NORTHCOM to command Title 10 forces, active component forces, in addition to the Title 32 forces in their state. And then in the event of a disaster where you're going to have that that side by side response, uh, the the affected state can nominate a dual status commander up to the secretary for appointment as a dual status commander, and then that person becomes a single unifying command for all of that military support flowing at state. We have seen that work seamlessly. It is one of the the best policy decisions I've seen in my career, and its implementation I think has gone a long way to integrating that, that military response. Where to the average citizen on the ground, they don't know if that person is a guardsman or an active component person who's coming to help them. Their shirt just says U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, and they're grateful for the help. Thank you, sir. Uh, Colonel Heidelberg, anything to add to that from a Florida perspective? The only thing I would add is absolutely, you know, we work for the governor first, so the National Guard is the first military response. I think our states have become more resilient, so we're not considered first responders, but that first military response. So we've tried to get away from that first responder because it takes us a little bit to, you know, alert, mobilize, and deploy unlike your firefighters or EMTs that might be in the county. Uh, so, you know, Florida has tried to get away from that first responder kind of uh, namesake, but we are the first military response. And I don't know if that helps answer or clarify the question, but uh, the dual status command comment is straight on. It's completely transparent to our state. Um, you know, once we have that dual status commander in the state, we bring in Title 10 forces. And uh, it, we have been a, you know, beneficiary of and hopefully a trendsetter uh, we always set up the dual status command uh, for the state of florida just in case we need those title 10 resources in and that's been a best practice for us thank you sir any additional insights or best practices from california General Harley, sir? well I, th I think the dual status command um comment is absolutely imperative to the way that we operate i, I just came back from la fleet week and doing a disca um event with our, our partners down in the United States Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton and, and the Navy uh, at, at Coronado. Um, they understand it, but it, it's also applicable not just to emergency response, but to pre-planned events. I was just the dual status commander at the Asia Pacific Economic Conference in San Francisco. Um, that command and the, the support that a dual status commander gets from Army North, U.S. NORTHCOM, as well as the state, it, provides a unity of effort and a unity of command that can't be done any other way. You can't have the left hand not speaking to the right hand. And bringing that together under a dual status commander, whatever status they may be, 
um, works very, very well to make sure that the mission is accomplished seamlessly. And, and we did that at the Asia Pacific Economic Conference. It shows that uh, good planning makes a rather boring execution. And that's what we like to see in emergency response. But um, it, it is a it is a very, very effective tool for us to use. Thank you so much, gentlemen. At this point, we have time for one more question. Synopsis. Hi, thank you all so much for doing this. Um, can you say anything about any healthcare missions that y'all are currently on? Do you have anything going? Colonel Doan, are you able to uh, let us know from an NGV perspective? Checking right now. Uh, yes, sir. So if, if you're if you're referring to sort of our, our, our COVID response, that COVID support role, we really are not doing that anymore. Um, is that what you're getting at, ma'am? No, just in general. I know that a huge portion of the Army, especially is mili uh, health care capabilities, are in the Guard. And I was wondering if y'all have any of that in support of combatant commanders or domestic. Well, I can certainly speak to the combatant commander part where we, we provide medical units uh, overseas as a routine uh, deployment all the time. And we, we currently continue to do that. And that's everything from medevac units to, to uh, combat support hospitals and, and everything in between. Uh, domestically, I, I think I would characterize most of our medical support more as planning right now than response. I, you know, and I think my, my colleagues in the States can probably provide a lot better data on that. But we, we certainly talk at our level about how we can better integrate the military health system into the civilian response in a homeland defense scenario. You know, if, we're, if we're needing to augment uh, civilian capacity, how will we do that? But also at the same time, maintain our ability to protect our own forces and uh, and, and not accomplish our mission. But I think I'm gonna to defer to my, my friends in the field there for what they're doing. Thank you, sir. I'll turn it to Florida first, if you have anything in the field. <clears throat> Yes, ma'am. So briefly, so we don't currently have any of our healthcare units deployed or activated on state active duty or Title 10. But I will say that COVID opened our eyes to the capabilities that might be needed for the state. And our state has, you know, spent a lot of money and a lot of resources, again, to, to be more resilient and less dependent on the military. But we are more incorporated in that medical training and that medical capabilities of not only responding to our soldiers, but also supporting our citizens. Uh, so we incorporate that a lot more into our training and our planning, but we currently don't have anybody conducting any medical missions in Florida. Thank you, sir. Uh, General Pelletti, California? Yeah, California, likewise. We don't have any currently doing domestic operations. Our Charlie Med is currently deployed on a federal mission, and we anticipate them back next year. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you everyone for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you to all of our panel members for your time and expertise and to the reporters for taking time out of your day to talk about National Guard domestic operations and support to natural disasters. If any of you have additional questions that were not addressed today, please reach out to the National Guard Bureau Public Affairs Media Team and we will run down answers for you. Our email address is listed in the chat box. A transcript of this roundtable will be posted on nationalguard.mil later today, and the recording will be uploaded to the National Guard Bureau YouTube page. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for doing this.